Welcome to another episode of the Ad Astra podcast. Today we have with us uh, Enrico Raffaelli. He is a specialist on history of Zoroastri and he is an associate professor of historical studies at the University of Toronto. Welcome, Welcome professor. Hello. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Mm-hmm. So, so um, can you tell us a little bit about your field of studies and, and, and your, your expertise in, in this particular field? Yes. So I will focus, of course, uh, on my research on astrology, but I would say that my research on astrology connects to my broader approach to the study of the ancient Iranian civilization. So I focus on the pre-Islamic period. So before uh, Islam became an is- Iran became an Islamic country in the mid 7th century of the common era. Uh, so that's my main um, well period of interest and I have focused in my research on the earliest textual uh, testimonies on Zoroastrianism, which is the Avesta, right, the collection of sacred writings. And I've also focused on the Pahlavi sources, meaning the sources in the Middle Persian language. So in my research, I've always tried to um, highlight the role of Iran as a cultural mediator, right, between I mean, I will, I will simplify and say East and West, because Iran was the center of the seat of, uh, well, different empires throughout antiquity, right, until the coming of, uh, until the Arab invasion, right, of Iran. And so being also located really midway between the well, classical civilization and Mesopotamian world on the one hand, and also the East, meaning the Indian world, um, on the other side, right? So it uh, naturally came to exert the role of, uh, again, cultural mediators so that doctrines and, uh, uh, well, themes and scientific notions uh, travel through the territory of Iran and they could be easily transmitted between uh, East and West, right? So now I've done quite a bit of research about uh, astrology in ancient Iran. I have to say, and just as a warning, that unfortunately we do not have many documents left, right? So we have properly, I mean, strictly speaking, astrological texts in ancient Iranian, pre-Islamic Iranian languages are very few. We only have um, some chapters in some Middle Persian texts. We have some astronomical doctrines in earlier texts in the Avesta, but those are not really astrological. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so in my research, I have tried to focus again the role specifically of Iran as a mediator of astrological doctrines between the classical world and the Indian world, and the presence of classical and uh, Indian doctrines in uh, pre Islamic Iran. So one theme that I may, per exa- for example, I, could, I might start uh, from discussing a little bit more in detail, and then if there is time, I can say a few words about other stuff, is one theme that I've studied in particular is the theme of the horoscope of the world. Oh. That is, yes, that uh, I'm yeah. sure that, yes, yes, <laughs> a part of the audience, yes, is familiar with this theme. So it's a theme that actually... Uh, was is first recorded in classical sources, right? So we have references to this notion, the idea that there is a theme of a birth chart of the world when the life of the world starts. So a description of the position of the planets when the world starts, right? And also the ascendant uh, in the theme of birth of the world. So this notion is first mentioned in uh, first in the first century of the Common Era, right? In class in a classic in classical astrological texts. Um, Well, shortly after we find um, another notion that is uh, uh, also present in in Zoroastrian astrology, in pre-Islamic Iranian astrological text, that is the birth chart of exceptional characters. We find it in Sanskrit Indian texts. Uh, So specifically the Yavana Jataka, right? It's a text that uh, 
whose chronology has been, in a sense, the traditional chronology of this text has been challenged recently, but it, it is certain that this text actually, as the title itself says, has a Western origin, origin Yavana Jataka, right? So it's from, so the Jataka of the Greeks. So anyway, um, how do the two notions, uh, what is the connection between the two notions? Well, in Iran, the theme, the classical notion of horoscope of the world and the Indian notion of birth chart of exceptional characters were merged at some point during the Sasanian period. Sasanian period means between the 3rd century and the 7th century of the common era. So the two notions, one coming from the West, from the Greek classical world and one coming from India, were merged together so that a combined horoscope was created for the first human being whose name in the Pahlavi uh, language is Gayomar, that's the name. It's just the first human, the first man. So I have to say first man because it's, it's just a kind of... So there, there is no woman, so there is no first woman in Zoroastrian mythology. Anyway, so uh, this man, is his life starts at the same time as the world. So they have the basically it's the same birth chart. So um, if I can get into technicalities, I don't know if really I'm, I don't please want to do, please do. <laughs> okay. So the classical birth chart of the world, in the classical horoscope of the world, the planets are all in the sign of their domicile, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in the Indian um, birth chart of exceptional characters, as described for the first time in the Yavana Jataka, the planets are all in, in the sign of their exaltation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes. So what we find in Iran is the notion of um, horoscope of the world, but the planets are not uh, in the same position as in the classical horoscope of the world, but they are actually in their exaltation. So now uh, this notion is later uh, transmitted to, uh, well, I could say Byzantine and Islamic astrology because we find the Iranian a birth chart of the world with all the planets in exaltation in some Arabic astrological texts. We find it in one um, Byzantine text uh, that is, well, it's published in the uh, Catalogus Codicus, uh, Codicum Astrologorum Grecorum. So uh, we find this, um, the Iranian birth chart of the world in Greek uh, translated in Byzantium, uh, in this text that is in the Vatican, so the Vaticanus Grecus, one th so 1191, that's actually the number of the code. Anyway, we find the Iranian birth chart in um, um, Arabic text, Byzantine text, and later we also find some Latin translation of uh, uh, Arabic texts containing the Iranian birth chart of the world, where the planets are in exaltation, in Latin, right? So. You see, f so this notion starts from the West, then it's modified in Iran based on some Indian notions, and then somehow goes back to the West because we find uh, it in uh, Latin translation of Arabic texts that are translated in turn from Middle Persian, right? Or influenced by Middle Persian astrology. Uh, so this is now given a, a little bit of technicalities, but probably more exciting or at least more interesting is to know what it what the birth chart of the world means in the context of uh, Zoroastrian astrology. So Zoroastrian is, is a religion that, I mean, all those who have some knowledge of this religion know is based on a dualistic, radically dualistic uh, view of the world, right? So the fight between good and evil. So what happened uh, in uh, uh, Sasanian astrology, so in the Sasanian time was that at some point, Again, this might have happened probably in the Sasanian period, the planets were demonized, meaning that they were considered as demons. Mm -hmm. So, um, what happens also, I'll have to introduce another notion, that is the uh, beginning of the life of the world and of the first man uh, coincides with the moment of the attack of the forces of evil on the cosmos. So the cosmos is good because it's been created by God, but at some point, at some point, demonic atta uh, forces attack the world, so they bring evil into the world. So what happens? At the beginning of uh, the life of the universe, when evil attacks, the planets are in the position of their exaltation. What does that mean? The planets are in a position of strength, 
the planets are demons, which means, so the birth chart of the world, in a sense, reflects the evil that is, in a sense, part of the condition of the world, starting from the beginning of its existence, when the mm -hmm. evil forces attack. So that's actually a notion that serves, in a sense, suits the purpose of uh, the, in a sense, of illustrating what is the view of the cosmos according to Zoroastrians oh, in the very, very interesting because it does it, it, it does differ from this context that uh, we have in medieval times because I'm a medievalist that um, yeah. they always uh, return to the beginning like the beginning was the perfect time and from the beginning on it was corruption or sin mm -hmm. or evil so it was like the perfect the, the garden of Eden and uh, that notion of perfection, initial perfection, pristine perfection, so it was good and then there was problems, let's put it this way. So for, for, this, um, for this variant, for the, the one that you're describing, the, the beginning of the world itself, it, it is evil in itself. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah, completely exactly. different. And I may add, I mean, I don't know, I don't want to give too many technical details, but I may <laughs> add another couple of references to notions that I think historians of astrology are familiar with, uh, that are also described in Pahlavi texts, uh, and that are also then later uh, described or at least mentioned in other sources that are influenced by um, Iranian culture. Anyway, one is the notion of the, the um, chronocratoria, so I don't know if I should use a, the English Chronocrator, absolutely, yes. The, the yes. measure of time, yes. Yes, and the specifically, yes, specifically the rule over some periods of time of constellation or planets. So in the Pahlavi sources, in the Middle Persian sources from the Sasanian times, or at least in one of them, we find this pretty peculiar notion that Saturn is the lord of the Mil the first millennium of existence of the world. So the, when the life of the world exists, Saturn is the lord of that millennium. Why Saturn? Well, everybody knows, all those with familiarity with the history of astrology know that Saturn is a, an evil planet. Mm -hmm. And so it's called the chief of the evil planet. And in the Zoroastrian cosmic texts, cosmological, astrological texts, it's considered as the general of the planets. So mm -hmm. meaning their head. So by being the lord of the first millennium, well, in a sense, marks uh, its influence, Saturn marks, marks its influence over a period of, well, over the beginning of the history of the world that is marked by the presence of evil. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one detail, and again, we find it in the same Byzantine text that I mentioned earlier. And, uh, well, this is a sign that the notion that Saturn is the lord of the seventh millennium is also found in this Byzantine text. Another notion that, in, in this case, it's even more famous, so to say, is the Melotasia, right? So the, the rule of the planets and uh, celestial body. bodies over parts of the body. And one thing in my research, in one article that I published three years ago, I've written what I'm going to say, um, and I would like perhaps to expand this explanation uh, in future publications or maybe presentations, I don't know. Anyway, the notion that, so traditionally this idea, we find a, a few references to the Melothesia in Pahlavi texts. So we have Pahlavi texts that say that, for example, Jupiter rules over this part of the body, Saturn is the lord of this part of the body, etc. So traditionally it's been mm, this, these references to the planets ruling over some parts of the body have been interpreted as a um, sign and indication that indeed uh, the so basically the, the text that con contain the text that contain this men these mentions of the rules of planets over parts of parts of the body would actually imply a positive um, view of the planets, right? So because so in other words, these passages would be an exception to the rule because. General, as a general rule, the planets are demons in Pahlavi sources, but then, according to some scholars, these couple of passages that describe the rule of the planets over the body would be, an, would be basically in contradiction with the negative view. But actually, what I have argued briefly in a publication, again, in an article I published three years ago, um, 
I don't think that's the case. Actually, the, the melothesia in the Pahlavi texts is consistent with the view, negative view of the planets, because after all, the notion, again, uh, that is uh, consequential to the idea that there was an initial attack of the demonic forces over the cosmos. So one consequence of this view is that the human body is corrupt. So in other words, it's dirty, it's polluted by, uh, so by evil. So the fact that some planets rule over parts of the body is a reflex of the fact that the body itself is dirty. <laughs> so, so that, that is also very interesting because you also find something that is not exactly the same, but is similar in some medieval texts because they say the pain uh, of the body. So they associate some planets or signs. Sometimes there are not planets, but signs. Mm -hmm. with the yeah. pain uh, in body not a good thing but pain so mm -hmm. maybe there's uh, some connections to this idea mm -hmm. absolutely yeah actually i would be happy to hear more about that because oh. i, I okay. wasn't familiar with this these notions so these are some themes that i've um tried to highlight in some past studies so the notion of a horoscope of the world and uh, the notion of the real, the chronocratoria, right? And also the notion of melothesia as indications of uh, the, um, well, uh, so as notions that are in line with the Zoroastrian cosmic view of the fight between good and evil and the idea that the world is uh, influenced by evil forces. Um, yep, yeah, I mean, I don't know, I can take a break and, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. The, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Does the, uh, this notion um, of the um, initial uh, problem or attack or the initial primal evil, so to say, does they offer any kind of redemption, solution? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. What is it? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so basically what will happen is that uh, um, well, okay, let's start from the first solution, meaning that uh, the current state of the world is considered as being a state of mixture, meaning that it, there is no, so evil doesn't completely rule over uh, our world. Evil is present, right, but it doesn't really completely, so our world is not really dominated entirely by evil forces. So for starters, after the initial attack, uh, on the cosmos, there was a fight, so the good celestial and also good uh, divine beings fought back, so that eventually they managed to temporarily defeat the evil forces, but then of course the evil forces are present in the cosmos, so they're not really eliminated, but they will eventually be eliminated, so the, the defeat will be definitive at the end of time, so after a time period of 6,000 years, the word uh, there will be a kind of final apocalyptic battle between all the good forces and the evil forces including the planets and uh, they will uh, be well eventually luckily the evil forces will be defeated so what will happen is that again the demons including the planets once more will be uh, defeated and um, uh, so what happens because we're interested in what happens in heaven, right? So there will be that the sky will get close to the earth. Some sources even say that the sky and the earth basically touch each other. And um, the, uh, there will be no movement anymore. So there will be an eternal zenith. So basically the sun will be at the top of the sky. Ah. <laughs> and uh, there will be light 24 hours, seven. And again, there will be no planets anymore because that, <laughs> because of the world defeated and even if they were there they wouldn't move so mm -hmm. but in, in, the, in this because this is absolutely uh, different from what we have learned from medieval and mm -hmm. Hellenistic astrology and fascinating but uh, it's completely different and uh, so when a planet is strong for them is wrong it's bad yeah. when mm -hmm. it's weak because if they are in the opposite sign mm -hmm. they will is it better somehow and also retrograde yeah, I was wondering <laughs> how does that affect their astrological interpretation. Yes, their notion of horoscope. If there is, um, if this cosmology, this cosmological view changes the way they interpret an horoscope, uh, or are, are they two separate example. things? Uh, okay, yes, definitely. That's actually an in, a very important question, because I have to say that what I've been described being is what we find in the religious sources, because I should have specified that almost all of the Zoroastrian sources in Middle Persian language 
are uh, what, religious sources, mm -hmm. um, or meaning that there are texts that are, embrace a religious perspective. We have a few fragments of um, non-religion so, so Pahlavi texts, and one of these texts, incidentally, I'm going to make a short digression, one of these texts that is an epic text that describes the rise to power of the first Sasanian emperor, Ardashir, does include a couple of references to astrology, and you have the king of the dynasty before the Sasanian asking the court astrologers, what do you predict for me and for the world? And they predict the coming of a new king. Plus, at some point, this Ardashir, who was supposed to be a slave, I mean, a servant of the previous king, um, well, runs away, and uh, the, the king asks uh, the, the court astrology to be, uh, to tell him based on the movements of the stars where his, uh, well, the person at his service has run away. So this um, is... Yeah, very, it's a uh, question, interrogation, yes. Interrogation of astrology. Form of astrology yeah. Yeah. So, in a, so I'll go back to the previous point. So the perspective of the planets as evil is a religious perspective, but in the actual daily life of Sasanian of the Sasanians, we are pretty much certain that that was not the notion oh, of, the, of the commoners. So I will just say that uh, well, we have traces through Islamic sources that planets were not really considered as evil, and we even have some. Um, well, fragments, fragmentary texts that are very late, where there are actually invocations to the planets for protection. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of magic astrology, right? If you yeah, think about it. Good. So, this invocation to the planets means you cannot invoke a demon, right, for protection. So, there is a, in that it's case. Not a good idea, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, there are some traces of a, a positive consideration of, mm -hmm. of the power of the planets. But anyway, um, regarding the praxis, again, I don't think that Sasanian astrologers in their daily practices would be really influenced by this notion. Mm -hmm. And um, what may be, uh, so if we want to really stick to the religious sources, because that's what we know better, I can tell you, give you maybe a couple of examples of explanations that we find. First of all, there is a dilemma, so it's difficult for, even for the, mm, priest astrologers who wrote the Pahlavi texts, or better, the priests with astrological competence who wrote the Pahlavi texts with astrological passages. For them, it was hard to coincide, coincide in a sense, to, um, in a sense to um, match the astrological consideration of Jupiter and Venus as good planets with the view that the planets are evil. So what they made, so what they did is that they said, okay, they're good, but that's because they were defeated in the initial battle against the ah. deities, defeated by their, I mean, deities who were their enemies. So eventually they were defeated, so they were forced to distribute good, although they didn't want to. So. <laughs> <laughs> what about the luminaries? Well, the luminaries, oh, the luminaries are always excluded. So I one see. thing that yeah, they're excluded from. They're not considered as planets. They're included in the birth charts, but they're not planets. We have the notion that there are seven planets, but this number is uh, um, so you, the, is reached by adding to the number of the five planets that were known in antiquity uh, the the um, the two lunar nodes, right? So you have the the head and tail of the dragon, right? That's actually the notion that was introduced. Anyway, so that's uh, the way they were called in Sasan in Iran. And the, 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 the head and tail of the dragon, in medieval times the tail is normally bad and the head is generally good. So is it the same here or is it, no, they are they're bad? Both, they're both bad, yes, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's no escape. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. They were considered to basically to be swallowing the luminaries, so they were... Yeah, being... During the eclipses, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Exactly. And they're actually, the, the, the head and tail of the dragon, they're also called the dark sun and the dark moon. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, I see. Makes sense. And uh, probably they will attribute extremely bad uh, interpretations to eclipses because of this. Yeah, course. absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's caused by this. What about know. retrograde mo movements? When yeah. the planets have this apparent, apparent retrograde movement, is it less bad because they are? No, actually, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. If actually, no, it's an important question what you're asking because um, the rational, scientific explanation that we find in the Pahlavi sources for why the planets are actually evil, one of them is that by moving backwards, 
backwards there. They contradict the prime, prime uh, primo mobile. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly, yes. exactly. Mm -hmm. Basically, because otherwise they would have a regular movement by going back. This is sign. This is a sign of disorder. So they, in a sense, they oppose the natural order of things that would be just a regular constant. Oh, movement. I see. Yeah. yeah, and um, yeah. Well, another thing. I don't know if I. If, you, if I can continue, one thing about the planets and because when you were asking me a question about how the practice, uh, I mean, how the view of the planets influences the practice, mm -hmm. the, um, one, the one reference we have to the birth chart of an individual in the Pahlavi sources is the mm, description of the birth chart of the first man. Okay, we know already that the first man has the same horoscope of birth as the word but uh, so this man keeps living so he has a life that lasts 30 years uh, so this there was a traditional doctrine according to which the first man lived for 30 years and then an astrological explanation was provided for why he lived for mm -hmm. 30 years so at birth Jupiter and Saturn were, were in the position of power right in exaltation of course but so um, and <clears throat> so Jupiter at some point, uh, so Jupiter was strong and so as such could help uh, the first man, Gaiomar, to live. But after 30 years, Jupiter was in dejection, so the position opposite to exaltation. And after 30 years, Saturn was actually back to the position of exaltation. Okay. So by being an, the chief of the evil planets, Saturn could exert its malefic influence and cause the death of the first man, who was not protected anymore by Jupiter, because Jupiter was in dejection, so that's what the, that's the explanation that we find. That in is interesting because it's very uh, rational, it's very scientific. In, yeah, and, and quite in tune with with an astrological explanation, and so that they're pushing the chart to they're treating it the mythical chart as a a, a regular chart would would at the time. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. So I suppose. And, the, no, please, please go on. Uh, I will just say that this suits the general uh, scheme, chronologically speaking, uh, speaking of Zoroastrian cosmology, where you have a cosmic year, meaning the duration of the life of the universe is 12,000 years, right? So it's actually a number that is very, very, I would say, calendric slash astrological 12. And then the second part, the part where the demons have attacked and polluted the world is 6,000 years. And then you have units that are formed by well, multiples of three. Well, the life of Gaiomer, the first man, is 30. So it is actually, <laughs> so you, this numerical scheme is reproduced. And in turn, I, again, I don't need to give too many details, but the 6,000 years of the period of mixture when the evil has polluted the world are in turn divided into three periods of 3,000 years. Mm -hmm. So this would be the, the, the second group of 6,000 years. So before we had 6,000 years with no problems. Exactly, with no problem, you know, well, uh, so no problems at all because the planets didn't exist. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly, so the planets had not been, or better, even if they existed, they had not attacked the world yet. So the planets, yeah, well, there is actually a detail that is a little bit shocking and racy. I don't want to shock anyone, but oh, it's... <laughs> <laughs> no, well, the detail about the formation, the way uh, the planets have been created is that the chief demon, whose name is Ahriman, in the ah. Persian language, has created, yeah, Ahriman, yes, he has created the planets by self-sodomy, so that was the offspring, <laughs> yes, it's a very strange notion. Do they, do they have images? <laughs> 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 that would be an interesting I could have And some kind of sculpture. That's, that would be a very yes, that would be a very interesting image, but we have no <laughs> it is said in a text that that's the way they came to exist. And so, but do they explain why what what motivated <laughs> Well of course it's part of course of the taboo against that type of action, type of of action. Is, and so it's instead of giving offspring like you would with regular intercourse you give an evil offspring evil. like no, an evil okay. intercourse so yeah but they're actually mm, they're actually it's quite unique in Zoroastrian cosmology to be born that way but the planets are so <laughs> well I think it's very unusual anyway and you know in the Bible what happened in Sodom Sodom so it's not no good, will be <laughs> no, no, no good. 
<laughs> the, the, the two luminaries are actually created by Ahura Mazda, the Supreme mm-hmm. God, in mm-hmm. a regular way. Yes. I mean, mm-hmm. Yeah, so he created the, the, the luminaries and the, there was like for 6,000 years, there was just peace and quiet and uh, light. Yeah, and, exactly, and, uh, exactly, because no. Ahriman, yeah, what happened is that uh, Ahriman tried to attack, but then Ahura Mazda uh, put him in a state of stupor. He recited a sacred prayer so that basically Ahriman fell and basically fell and he was kind of unconscious for 3,000 years. And during those, those 3,000 years, Ahura Mazda created the material world. He previously had created the spiritual world, but then he created the material world and the world existed in peace with no disturbance. But then the actual... And no humans period, also, no humans. No, no people. Well, actually, the, okay, the first human that I've already mentioned, actually, to be precise, he he did live for 3,000 years before the attack, but his condition in the mixed state, so his condition in the world the way we know it, was uh, uh, only for 30 uh, years because of the because of the power of the planets. Uh, but um, well, I could go on on Zoroastrian cosmology. I will just say that during those. During those those three thousand years, there was no planet, but the moon uh, and the the sun, and also the stars. By the way, the stars are benefic, right? So they have a good power. They existed, and um, but in terms of uh, living beings, there was one human, one animal, and uh, one plant. After the attack, yes, yes, one plant only. After the attack, what happened? Animal. What animal was it? They don't. It was. It was a. It was a a cow, basically, so it was a cow, cow bull, uh, although recently actually I've been reading an article that quite interestingly was claiming that indeed it's a bull, but traditionally what I've always, the way I've always interpreted this animal is that it's a sort of have both attributes, like cow and bull. Hermaphrodite, and Hermaphrodite, yeah, cow. Exactly. Uh, yes, <laughs> and, and, and the so, yeah, <laughs> and, the and the plant. The plant is not really said what species it okay. is, it's just called the plant. And then after the attack, one of the good things that happened, so Gayomar, so the first man lives for 30 years, unfortunately, the animal and the plant, they are killed right away, but oh. through their seed, all the plant species and animal species are born. And no women. <laughs> Uh, no, no. The women, well, I'll, I will tell you what happens at the, at the death of Gayomar, the first man, what happens when, due to the evil power of Saturn, he dies. Uh, at some point, he uh, basically, at death, he fecundates, so he emits some semen that from which a plant is born. And from this plant of rhubarb, rhubarb plant, the first couple is born. So you see, that's the notion. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, it's kind of very... Um, Complex. Complex. Uh, yeah, and um, <laughs> complex, obvious, <laughs> modified, genetically um, interesting. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. If if I don't know, maybe I'm talking too much. But, uh, oh no, 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 please! It's absolutely fascinating because we had just a very basic idea of uh, of this this mythology and. Mm-hmm. Uh, these details they are they are absolutely fascinating. fascinating yes. yes, I wasn't aware of that. So are there correlations between this and the Bible? Because you know, they, they, they would say in the Bible, the, 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 the astrologers who, who pick on the Bible, they would say that God created the planet and God and because it's God, they are good. And because they are created by God, they are in their best possible position. So it's kind of another way of looking at this. Yeah. The idea is still there, mm-hmm. but they look at this from another perspective. So, uh, and that because, and what they say is that uh, when um, when we had the biblical, uh, what I call the bi- biblical incident with the apple, <laughs> you know, when they um, the plant they they are expelled from the paradise, mm-hmm. and the planets, planets begin they they are, are motion, they yeah. are set in motion. Yeah, so it's true. Basically, it's from motion that comes the problem. Mm-hmm. Ah, okay, so that's actually that's an, a good point. I don't know, I wouldn't know if there's really a direct connection with the Bible, right? Because uh, the biblical story, but the notion of um, um, of the movement of the celestial body starting at the beginning after the attack of the demons, that's definitely present in Zoroastrian. So as soon as the attack comes, then 
the celestial world starts to move. Yeah, and, uh, and probably it, it, because this this uh, biblical uh, narrative also associates the movement of the planets because they move out of their perfect place. The movement is in the movement that the it's problem the lies. It's the, it's the problem. Yeah, it's the movement that causes change. So before the expulsion of paradise, everything is motionless because it's perfect, and then they're expelled, and things start to change, and the planets and the skies also move according to, to to cause or to signify that change yeah. To yeah, it's it's a similar notion yes basically mm -hmm. one thing i wanted to say because i talked a lot of the planets i've mentioned the stars but i will i have to mention because no description of zoroastrian cosmology and astronomy slash astrology can be considered as complete if uh, one doesn't say that the notion of that, that the stars are good Mm -hmm. The stars, aside from the shooting stars, because that's an exception, the shooting stars are evil. But the stars, but uh, they move. <laughs> they move. It's true, it's true. But it's disorderly movement. So anyway, and it's a, a plus. It's a move. One another thing is that they move, but they also appear to fall on the earth. So they break the boundaries between heaven and earth. So that's 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 bad. You shouldn't do that. So <laughs> bad star, bad star. <laughs> bad, yes, bad behavior. So now the stars are good, of course, because they have been created by God and um, well this notion is first expressed actually much earlier than the Pahlavi texts mm -hmm. uh, in the Avesta we have actually some hymns to the Sun uh, the moon and to the star Sirius the star Sirius is basically the pro protagonist star she's actually she or it I don't know how to call it it is even present in the birth chart of the world in the Pahlavi sources so mm -hmm. because it's so important but we have in the Avesta full hymn that is actually also from the literary point of view, a very good uh, text. I, like, I mean, it's from the point, poetic point of view, it's an excellent work. Uh, and it's a hymn to Sirius, and it describes how Sirius defeats the shooting stars who are causes of drought. And uh, so Sirius is one of the, is basically the leader of the stars who, whose regular movement is a reflection of the cosmic order, exactly the opposite of the planet, right? Who go back and forth and, their movement is a sign of disorder. It's erratic, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's erratic. really interesting, yes. And Sirius is, I think, the the brightest star in the in the Visible. northern hemisphere. Yeah. So it's probably because of this. It's if you take out the planet, Sirius would be the brightest star. But it's only visible during winter because it's near Cancer. So we can only see it in in the winter months. I would say. What do you think? Yeah, so yeah, it's well, very, very interesting. In summer, in the canicula, so we wouldn't see it. But we have Orion, and I think Orion is associated with Ahura Mazda somehow. Mm, yeah, although it doesn't really, it's not really clear, it doesn't appear clearly in the texts. Only s among the major stars we have Sirius. That's and then Sirius, mm. okay. And how, what, what is the image associated with Sirius? Because the, the Greeks have the dog. The, the, the dog star. <laughs> the dog star, yes. Well, actually, the um, so the, the the Sirius is associated with different animals. It's supposed to take uh, uh, three different forms: bull, horse, uh, and human. And uh, as part of his uh, of its fo um, fight against the demons of drought. Mm -hmm. But I mean, unfortunately, one unfortunate trait is that we do not have. Uh, um, many iconographic sources uh, on uh, Zoroastrian cosmology. We have, ironically, uh, well, no, I don't know if ironically is the right word, but anyway, uh, interestingly, we have traces of uh, the Iranian iconography, an influence of Iranian iconography in much, much later sources than the Sasanian times. In the Renaissance, actually, we have, uh, uh, so the uh, room of the months in uh, the Ferrara, in the city of Ferrara in the north, there is a representation of the decans, mm -hmm. and uh, it's influenced by, a, actually it's influenced by Abu Mashar's, right, uh, introductory text to astrology, who in turn was influenced by the Iranian representations of the decans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is this yeah. Stefanoia? Yes, Stefanoia, exactly, this palace mm -hmm. Stefanoia. There are some traces, of, so if you want to find, of course you don't need to go that far, but uh, you find clearer traces of Iranian iconography in well, some iconographic artistic 
documents that are so so much later than Sasan and Iran than from Sasan and Iran itself. That is interesting. Why would it uh, in in so later in so yeah. late in time, and they yeah. would choose this specific iconography for yeah. Sasanaya? Yeah. Well, it's through um, Arabic translations, so, mm, so Iranian, pre-Islamic Iranian astrology influenced heavily, mm, um, well, uh, Islamic astrology. And so through Latin translation from Arabic, we come, mm, we get some well, elements of that originate from pre-Islamic Iran that are present even in, well, in Western medieval or, or early modern culture. And the Palazzo Stefano, yes, is case in point. Yeah, it, it is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, and I was wondering, since since you started at the beginning, what kind of astrological documents do we have? So we've been talking about, as you said, most of it comes from religious uh, writings uh, and religious documents. Um, so what corpus of astrological documents do you have from that period which are more direct this, uh, yes. uh, yeah and uh, so well the the corpus unfortunately what we have is very small we have basically Pahlavi texts that are based on Pahlavi Zoroastrian texts that are based on the commentary to the Avesta and um, well, it's a corpus. Actually, there are two or three texts that have a few passages. So we, in other words, we don't have any full text uh, that is only astrological. We have chapters here and there in religious sources that, uh, um, well, reflect the integration of astrology in the religious corpus. Mm -hmm. and then we have again one fragment that I've already meant, that I mentioned before of. Um, uh, questions given by the king to the court astrologers in an epic text. And then we have a few lines here and there. Uh, we know, though, that uh, many other sources exist, like uh, translations of Dorotheus Sidonius mm -hmm. text, translations of uh, Vetius Valens, uh, translations of Theocrus the Babylonian, and that's actually the one, the Paradantellon Tatois de Canois. That's um, the Middle Persian translation of that Greek text is the one that was later used by Abu Masher, and then it's used by Pietro Dabano, sorry I'm using the, the Italian name, and oh. that's how Palazzo Schifanoia, you, that's why you find, uh, well, the Iranian element in Palazzo Schifanoia through all this long chain. So we know that there was a corpus of sources that was not at all as, as small and as religious as the religious uh, texts are. So we have traces of that through, again, mm, Arabic testimonies and mentions of uh, uh, passes. Plus we have so many uh, wars of clear Pahlavi derivations in Arabic, which is an additional reflex of uh, mm -hmm. the popularity. Um, historical astrology, which is a form of astrology that aimed at predict, right, the future fate of uh, dynasties, Kings was actually invented, invented so to say, in Sasanian Iran, and we do not have any. If you ask me, in terms of corpus, unfortunately, we don't have any real text that has come down to us. But we know a text of this sort existed in mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Sasanian Iran. And these texts, uh, these astrological texts, which would circulate and which we don't have examples, would probably be in Greek, would Greek be the language or there would be there would be translation at this time already? Yeah, no, no, there, there were texts that were actually in Pahlavi, in Middle Persian, and uh, many, I mean, early uh, Islamic astrologers knew Pahlavi because they were Iranians themselves and they could uh, translate it from Pahlavi, translate texts from Pahlavi into Arabic. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it is. It is fascinating. I think we could stay yeah. here forever. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. It is interesting to to understand these transitions. These are, I, I'm asking all these questions because it's not really a period that I'm familiar with. I just know it in very general terms, and it's interesting to 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 see this. Uh, what um, what is interesting, and I've been thinking of other conversations that we've been having with with other researchers, is that. This period here, the, all this area, this geographical area in this period seems to be critical to understand how the transmission of certain ideas within the astrological corpus are made and how 
certain ideas developed and can give, have continuity in practice and some ideas appear, apparently didn't and others ideas like for example the the, the world the history uh, the, the astrological history seem to appear uh, at, at this adopted. period and yeah. are highly adopted yes. and have a long history from that so it is sort of a, a critical point uh, in history, this mixture, this, this transmission and this processing uh, of, of, um, of okay. astrological materials to understand exactly how does it change from uh, the, the, uh, the classical period then the combination with the, 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 all the Hindu influences and how did that, does yeah. that cross and creates what we, the, the astrological doctrine that we'll see then in Arabic periods and, and later in Latin uh, transmission. And yet, uh, although it is like a hub where everything seems to go through this area, but at the same time, from what you're saying, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, at least I had the idea that it has its own personality also. It is like a, a hub of everything, but also it manages to have its own personality and correct me if I'm wrong. Absolutely, but... absolutely. Yeah, well, again, I've mentioned, I mean, historical astrology, but even the first, the notion that I've spent more words on, that is this, the horoscope of the world, is an original creation after all, because, okay, the, the notion of horoscope of the world comes from um, the, from, from the classical world, then the structure uh, of the plan, the, the hor uh, a horoscope with all planets in exaltation was first introduced in India, but then Iranians combine it and they create a completely new horoscope. But uh, then I could continue. There are so many other notions that were introduced uh, uh, in Iran. And uh, the iconography of the decans that we find later represented is uh, something that was added by Sasanian astrologers. Uh, the translations, we have some uh, translations of, so the, we do not have, unfortunately, the translations of Betius and of Dorotheus uh, in Pahlavi, but then we have fragments, or in the case of Dorotheus, the whole, full text, uh, that allow us to see how many modifications were mm -hmm. in all likelihood made in Sasanian Iran. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, it was an original system of uh, beliefs. Yeah. Like they, have, uh, they have their own personality. Uh, and they, they were like drinking from different sources and then they, they created something that is exactly consistent, consistent to their own uh, culture. Uh, absolutely. That's, I would say it's a very, very nice way to describe <laughs> the, the contribution, yes. Well, I think we, we uh, want uh, to to learn more, but uh, for now, I think we will uh, stop. Do, yeah. you, do you have uh, any, um, well, if you have more ideas, please let us know, because <laughs> this has been fascinating. Yes, yes. Uh, we could stay forever <laughs> asking yeah. questions. Uh, otherwise... Yeah. Perhaps we will, we will, we will stay, uh, we'll close the, the, the podcast, okay. and with an invitation, uh, for, another for another podcast where we can discuss other more specific examples and the, the, the world yes. uh, astrology, uh, the historical astrology, because I think it's fascinating. Yes, so. yes, uh, yes. Uh, like officially, we want to invite you for a second podcast sometime okay. in the future where we can um, study, uh, look at, uh, for instance, examples <laughs> or other ideas because this does not fit in one podcast alone. Yeah, no, 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 there are so many things I could have added, for example, on, I will just say one last word about how there are traces that in Sasanian astrology, of course not in religious texts, but there were also some, uh, in the same way as we have uh, evidence that planets were not always considered as demons by actual astrologers, we have also evidence that the stars were not only considered as good, because we have passages, of course, in later sources in Arabic, where there are evil stars <laughs> and so that's yeah. something like that's yeah. exactly. like the, the head of the demon Haldol. yeah <laughs> which is not not a good star yes i was thinking about that when you said and also the other thing that you can uh, uh, you can address in mm -hmm. the future podcast is melotesia also mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely mm -hmm. fascinating mm -hmm. so we will say goodbye for oh. now and thank you very thank much you. for for being our guest Thanks a lot. Thanks for inviting me again. Quite interesting. Thanks. Thanks.